This video will look at how to calculate the cell potential when a cell is at non-standard conditions. We will also look at electrolytic cells and electroplating. So when you have a voltaic cell here that's at non-standard conditions, right? What we mean by that is basically, let's say we said one of our standard conditions was that you're at one molar for your solutions. Well, let's just say the solution you're using is not at one molar. That would mean you're not at standard conditions here. Well, when you have these cells that are at non-standard conditions, basically they follow Le Chatelier's principle. So if you were to increase the concentration of a reactant, so now your uh, concentration of your reactant is increased, obviously the forward reaction would need to take place in order to use up that extra concentration of your reactant. And then if you had an increase in concentration of your product, well, that means the reverse reaction is going to be favored in order to use up that extra concentration here of the product. So essentially, if you're going greater than one mole here for your product, uh, one molar, then you would know the reverse reaction is going to be favored. So let's look at this example. It says, for the reaction below, predict whether the E for the cell, notice it's not E naught because we're not at standard conditions here, predict whether the E for the cell is larger or smaller than the E naught would be for the cell. So the E naught would be when we're at one molar here. So we have two conditions here for A and B, but notice they gave us uh, the overall equation. So for A, I see that the Al3 plus is going to be two molar. Well, that's not standard, but the Mn2 plus is one molar. Well, that's standard here. So one is standard, one isn't. So look at the actual reaction. The one that's different is the Al3 plus. It's greater, it's two molar. In the reaction here, the Al3 plus is on the product side. So what this is saying is, I have a greater concentration of one of my products. Well, therefore, if you have more of, a, of your product, Le Chatelier's principle says, the reverse reaction is going to be favored, right? So you're going to form the reactants here. So basically, what happens to the cell potential under these conditions? If your reverse reaction is favored, your cell potential is going to be smaller here, all right? The forward reaction would generate a certain cell potential, but then when you reverse it, it's going to be smaller, okay? Compared to uh, the E naught here, the, the one under standard conditions. Uh, and then when we look at our kind of second example here, B, I can see that this time the Al3 plus is the one molar, but the Mn2 plus is three molar. So the Mn2 plus is the non-standard conditions here. So when I look at this, the Mn2 plus is on the reactant side, it's greater, we have a greater concentration here, not smaller, it's greater, it's three molar instead of one molar. So that means the forward reaction is going to be favored. So if we're favoring the forward reaction here, the E not, um, so the E for the cell is going to actually be larger than what the original E naught would be. Remember, because we are not at standard conditions, we're talking about the E for the cell instead of the E naught here. The E naught would be when it's under standard conditions. So basically, if the forward reaction is favored, you're going to have a larger E, and if the reverse reaction is favored, you're going to have a smaller E. And you can use Le Chatelier's principle here to kind of figure that out. So if you're just given something like this and you need to kind of figure out whether it's gonna be larger or smaller, just use Le Chatelier's principle, all right? You don't have to do any math here, but realize there's actually an equation we can use if we need to do math here to prove this. The equation we can use to calculate the E of a cell at non-standard conditions is called the Nernst equation. You are uh, not given this equation on your equation sheet, uh, so I will give you this equation on any quiz exam. You just need to know how to use it. So your E here, remember, this would be your E for the cell at non-standard conditions would be equal to the E naught. So that would be your normal E that you could calculate at standard conditions, minus 0 0.0592 all over N. N is going to be the number of electrons here in your balanced reaction. Be careful that the number of electrons that essentially cancel out here when you add up your half reactions, 
times the log of Q. Q is essentially your reaction quotient here. It'd be your products raised to a power all over your reactants raised to a power, but it's the concentrations here. So that's going to be important. The math is a little interesting here. Uh, so this is where the concentrations would come in. The concentrations would come in uh, to Q here. All right, so just keep in mind what we're actually looking at here. They could ask us to use those concentrations, get Q, uh, use N, use your original E naught to calculate just what the new E would be. Or you could be given the measured E now, so we know what the original E naught should be based on standard conditions. We might measure the actual potential under conditions. We might ask, actually be asked to calculate for one of the concentrations here, which would involve us solving for Q and going further, right? But you need to realize here that Q is going to be your concentration of products to the power here over your concentration of reactants to the power like you would expect using equilibrium. So we're going to have to look at this. The math can be interesting depending on what we're solving for. So this is the equation we can use to find E or to find a concentration when you're at non-standard conditions. We can do our first example here. This says calculate the cell potential at 298 Kelvin generated by the reaction below under these conditions. And I can see right away here that my concentration of my dichromate is two molar. So I know I'm not at standard conditions. One molar for the H plus, one molar for the I minus. And then I can see my concentration of the CR3 plus is also not at standard conditions here. So I have to calculate this cell potential. So I'm looking for my new E essentially. Before I can even do that, I'm going to need to find E naught here so I can use it in the Nernst equation. So I have to use my reaction and uh, write my half reactions here. If you notice, this one looks a little bit more complex. It doesn't look like there's just, you know, two substances in your reactants and products, which is typically what you see for one of these oxidation reductions. And that's because one of your half reactions has a little bit more going on here. Uh, so when you see the substances involved here, you need to realize uh, what's actually taking place. Uh, when you look up your uh, standard reduction potentials, you need to realize here that this CR2072 minus has a lot more going on with it. It has these H plus with it. It also has water with it on the product side. So that's a little bit more interesting. Uh, you can see which is being oxidized and which is being reduced here. If you notice, the iodine goes from one minus to zero here, all right? So the iodine is the one that is going to be uh, losing electrons here as it loses uh, negatives it becomes a zero charge. So that's going to be the oxidation. You'll need to flip that one. But when you look up and actually find this dichromate half reaction, it's going to stay as the reduction. But like I said, when you look it up, it's a little bit more involved. We have our CR2072 minus plus 14H plus in this half reaction plus 6E minus going to the 2Cr3 plus plus 7 water here. And the E naught for that, all right, this is a reduction. It's gaining electrons. So it's written as is, is 1.33 volts, right? But then when you look up your iodine standard reduction potential, it actually needs to be flipped because it's uh, being oxidized here, okay? So we have our um, I minus here sorry, 2I minus, we have to be careful, going to I2 plus 2E minus here. All right, we have to be careful of the overall charge. There needs to be 2I minus going to I2 plus 2E minus here. And because this was, uh, this is being oxidized or losing electrons, we have to flip the sign of our E naught. So we get negative 0 0.54 volts. So now I can add these up here to get my E naught. So my E naught would be equal to 0 0.79 volts. Remember, that's not going to be my final answer here. This is uh, what you would expect the cell potential to be if you were at standard conditions here. 
Okay, so now I have to keep going uh, with this problem. In order to plug into my uh, Nernst equation here, I need Q. But remember, essentially Q would be equal to the concentration of products raised to a power over the concentration of reactants raised to a power, and you're going to have to use your balanced equation here. So Q would be equal to, if we look at um, our equation, uh, the solid and the liquid here in the products are not going to participate in the equilibrium, so it would be the concentration of the CR3 plus squared because of the 2 in the balanced equation all over the concentration of the CR2072 minus, all right, times the concentration of H plus to the 14th here because of that balanced equation times the concentration of I minus to the 6th here. So that would be my Q based on the reaction I have. Remember, solids and liquids don't participate in equilibrium. You still have to raise it to the power uh, of the coefficient, but products over reactants. So when I plug in my values here, I have 1.0 times 10 to the minus fifth squared on the top, all over uh, 2.0 times 1.0 to the 14th times 1.0 to the sixth here, all right? So when I plug and chug for Q, I get five times 10 to the minus 11th. So that's the value of Q. Now I'm ready to plug in to my Nernst equation to solve for my E here. So E is going to be equal to E naught minus 0 0.0592 all over N times the log of Q here. Remember, E is what I'm solving for. I want to find the cell potential when I'm not at standard conditions. E naught I already found to be 0 0.79 volts minus the 0 0.0592 all over N. Remember, N is the number of electrons in the balanced equation. In order for these electrons to cancel out, uh, you would have to get the electrons to both be six. So it's over six times the log here of Q, which is five times 10 to the minus 11. So this just becomes being careful with uh, your math here. What I would do first is I would multiply these two terms together, okay? Do the multiplication here, this 0 0.0592 divided by six times the log of five times 10 to the minus 11, get your number, then do the subtracting to get your E. I would make sure you can do the math. When you do uh, plug and chug this here, you do get E being equal to 0 0.89 volts here. So this would be the cell potential when we are not at standard conditions. You can see here that it went up, all right? So this would be our E uh, not at standard conditions or our E under non-standard conditions. So this is just a pretty basic example here of calculating E, but you had to find the E naught first, you had to find Q, and then you could plug everything in with N to solve for your E at non-standard condition. Remember, it's going to be in volts still because it is a cell potential. Let's look at another example here that's a little bit more fun. Uh, this one says if the voltage of the cell below is 0 0.45 volts at 25 degrees Celsius, when the concentration of zinc 2 plus is 1 molar and the pressure of H2 is 1 atm, what is the concentration of H plus? So essentially here, they are telling us the E of this cell when it's at these non-standard conditions. I know we're not going to be at standard conditions here because they're looking for the concentration of H plus. If it doesn't come out to be 1 molar, I know I'm not at standard conditions. Uh, so I'm going to have to use the Nernst equation here, uh, but I'm going to have to do a little bit more work here. Essentially, they're giving me the E right now. This is not E naught. I'm going to have to find E naught, and if I'm looking for the concentration, what I'm actually going to solve for in the Nernst equation is Q, and then I'm going to have to use Q to eventually get to this concentration. We have to be very careful with the math here, and you have to pay attention to what you're solving for. If one of these problems involving the Nernst equation asks you to solve for the new 
potential, you would just solve for E like we did in the previous example. But if they're asking you to solve for the concentration of one of these at non-standard conditions, you're going to have to solve for Q and then use that to get to the concentration. But before I can even get to that point, I need to look at my reaction, figure out which is being oxidized and which is being reduced so I can calculate E naught here. So according to the problem, I have my zinc solid going to Zn2 plus, so that means it's losing electrons. So that one's being oxidized and my hydrogen is going from plus to zero. So that means it's gaining electrons. So that one's being reduced. So when I look up my standard uh, reduction potential list, the hydrogen is going to stay as the reduction, stay as written. So that one here is going to be the um, 2H plus plus 2E minus going to H two here. And the E naught for that is going to be equal to 0, 0.00 volts. All right. So that one is being reduced. So it stays as written on the uh, standard reduction potential list. But the zinc is being oxidized. So you have to remember to flip it and flip the sign. So I'm going to have Zn solid here going to Zn2 plus plus the 2E minus and my E naught has to have the sign flip, so it's going to be 0 0.76 volts. So when I add these up, my uh, E naught here is 0 0.76 volts. This would be the cell potential if you were at standard conditions. All right, so now I can actually plug in here to the Nernst equation. We know it's E equals E naught uh, minus 0 0.0592 all over N. And that would be times the log of Q here. Remember, we are solving for uh, Q in this case. So when I plug in my E, this would be the uh, cell potential when you're not at standard conditions. That would be the 0 0.45 volts here. And that would be equal to your E naught, which we found to be uh, 0 0.76 volts. If you were, you know, wondering, well, am I really at standard conditions or am I not? When you calculate your E naught and you see it's not the same as your E here for the cell, uh, you know that you're not at standard conditions. Uh, so we're going to have this subtracted by 0 0.0592 all over N. In our balanced equation for the electrons to cancel, they would cancel as is, but there's two of them. So this is going to be over 2 times the log of Q here. So now you just need to solve for Q, but you have to be careful here. It's the math that is problematic for most people. All right. So the first thing I would do, I'm going to write this up here. The first thing I would do is subtract, okay, the 0 0.76 from both sides. That's the first thing I would do. Subtract this uh, 0.76 from both sides. Then what you would do is you want to divide here, okay, divide this um, negative 0 0.0592 divided by two term uh, by both sides. All right, so after you do your subtracting, take this term here, this negative 0 0.0592 divided by two, whatever that equals, divide that by both sides. Remember, this is now multiplied by the log of Q here, so it has to be divided by both sides to uh, get rid of it. And then the last thing I would do here, because essentially you're going to have a number equal to the log of Q, you're going to need to do uh, 10 to the power of whatever number you get there to get Q. All right, so whatever number you get equal to the log of Q, you do 10 to the power of that number and that will give you Q here. When you do the math correctly, again, I would make sure you can plug this in and actually get this number. It should come out to be 3.0 times 10 to the 10th, okay? This is not your concentration of H plus. This is just what Q equals, right? Because they asked us to find one of the concentrations, you use Nernst to find Q, and then you use that to find the concentration here. So when we actually write out our Q expression, Based on the equation, 
we're going to have Q equal to, remember, it's products over reactants. Pay attention to the balanced equation here. You're going to have the concentration of Zn2 plus uh, times here. Now, this is a gas, and they gave us the hydrogen in pressure, so we're just going to use the pressure of H2 here instead of the concentration. They can actually be used kind of interchangeably here in this example. Uh, all over my reactants. My zinc is a solid, so it does not participate in Q here in the equilibrium. So it's all over the concentration of H plus. But remember, uh, balance equation, so this is going to be squared. So I plug in what I know here. I know Q is 3.0 times 10 to the 10, and that's going to be equal to, I know the concentration and the pressure of uh, the zinc 2 plus, and the hydrogen are both one, so essentially it's just going to be one times one here, all over the concentration of H plus squared. Well, I don't know that. That's what I'm solving for. So essentially that's going to be X, but you have to square it according to your Q expression. So you just need to do the math here, all right? Cross, multiply, solve for X. When you do that, you get X being equal to 5.8 times 10 to the minus six, and this is a concentration, so that's molar. So the concentration here of the H plus will be 5.8 times 10 to the minus 6 mole. So this is just another example here of uh, one of these problems using the Nernst equation. You're either going to need to calculate the E under the non-standard conditions like we saw in the previous example, or you're going to be asked to calculate one of the concentrations uh, like here where you solve for Q and then use that to find the concentration. Uh, just watch your math. Be careful with that and watch your units in your final answer. Let's look at another example here um, that kind of requires a little bit of thinking. Uh, this is not a math kind of problem. This is a thinking and understanding type of example here. So it says, consider this galvanic cell based on this reaction. They gave us the reaction. We are given the E naught here, 1.56 volts. Uh, and then it says, if two grams of NaI solid are added each half cell, what happens to the cell voltage? And then you have to explain here. So basically, we have this set up. You can picture your uh, galvanic cell in two separate compartments, two separate beakers taking place. Uh, you could see what's happening at each side. But then we're adding this NAI to each kind of beaker here. And we have to see, you know, what would take place when that happens. All right. So the first thing I would do here is I just want to make sure that I understand uh, what's taking place in terms of the oxidation and reduction. So uh, for the silver here, it's going from plus to zero. So that means that one is gaining. So that would be reduced. And then the zinc is going from zero to two plus. That's losing electrons. That would be oxidized. Okay. So just that's kind of just for my kind of reference here in case I need it. Maybe I don't need it. But I like to make sure I always do that here so I know what's going on. But really, what you need to think about is here, what happens in each kind of beaker when this NAI is added? Okay, so when you add NAI to the uh, beaker with the zinc 2 plus, think about the solution here uh, in the zinc kind of side, all right, would have the zinc metal with the zinc 2 plus. If I add NaI to that, think about this. This is an ionic solid. It's going to dissociate. I'm going to get Na plus I minus. Well, if I, you know, get the I minus combining with the zinc 2 plus, because realize the Na plus can't combine with the zinc 2 plus in the beaker, um, I'm going to end up with a substance that, you know, is still soluble here. It's not going to combine or do anything like that. So essentially, it would just stay as ions. But on the uh, silver uh, side here, dealing with the silver uh, part of the half cell, when I add NaI to that beaker, the Ag plus ion that's in there will react with one of the ions in the NaI. So remember, the NaI is an ionic solid. It's going to dissociate into Na plus and I minus. The Ag plus will actually combine with the I minus and precipitate out. All right, that forms a solid here. So what ends up happening is essentially your Ag plus combines with the I minus, precipitates out, 
of that side. So basically what's happening is the concentration of your AG plus is now going to be lower here. All right. So in the uh, in the uh, cell involving the silver, the AG plus is combining with the I minus precipitating out. So the concentration of this goes down. So now if we think about our reaction here, basically one of our reactants is now at a lower concentration. So in terms of Le Chatelier's principle here, we know the reaction is going to shift to the left. If this is less, it's going to shift, shift to the left here to form more of that. So when you shift to the left, your reverse reaction, what happens to the cell voltage? Well, it's going to decrease. And that happens here because AGI will precipitate out, all right? And you can explain this in terms of because that concentration is now lower, uh, the reverse reaction is going to take place, which will cause the cell potential to decrease. So anytime you're adding a substance here to both half cells, look for a precipitate and then think about what that would do to your actual equation. If it causes the forward, to happen because of Le Chatelier's principle, you would increase the cell potential. If it has, uh, if the reverse has to take place according to Le Chatelier's principle, then you would decrease the cell potential. So make sure you can explain something like this. You don't need any math to do this, um, but you need to be able to explain this in terms of Le Chatelier's principle and the understand that there would be a precipitate forming. So you need to know your solubility rules here so you can predict the precipitate. Now we want to switch gears here and look at electrolysis. Essentially, we're going to be looking at these electrolytic cells now. Electrolysis is when you use or apply electric current here to make a chemical change happen. Essentially, when you have a thermo unfavored uh, cell here, you apply an electric current to cause the reaction to take place. Remember, uh, thermo favored cells generate an electric current but thermo unfavored cells or electrolytic cells need an electric current here in order to go. All right. So that's very important to understand that an electrolysis reaction would need some form of external energy source here to make that actually happen because it's unfavored. All right. This is very useful to separate ores, to kind of purify these ores, or it's also very useful to plate out metals here. But the key is you will need some form of outside energy source to make it go because these cells are thermo unfavored. We definitely need to know some of the differences here between voltaic or galvanic cells and these electrolytic cells. So you need to know these differences. First, we already know that an electrolytic cell is thermo unfavored, so it requires an external energy source. Essentially, you would not be generating a current here. You would need some type of current to make this go. Another big difference is that electrolytic cells occur in a single container, All right, That's a big difference here. If you see kind of a reaction here and it's in a single container, that's kind of telling you that this is probably one of these unfavored or electrolytic cells. Don't forget that a voltaic cell is a battery, it's generating the electric current, but an electrolytic cell needs a battery. It needs an external power source to actually uh, occur here. Uh, anox red cat still applies. So the anode is where oxidation occurs. Reduction is where uh, is going to take place at the cathode. All right, but there's a difference here for these electrolytics. The charge is reversed. We know that in a voltaic cell, we are going to have the anode being negative and the cathode being positive. But in an electrolytic cell, the cathode is negative and the anode is positive. So you need to realize that reduction is still taking place at the cathode. The uh, oxidation is still taking place at the anode. But for an electrolytic, the sign is switched. That's another big idea here. And these electrolytic uh, oftentimes do use these inert electrodes that we talked about, like platinum or graphite. Uh, but realize just because you see one of these inert electrodes doesn't mean it's automatically electrolytic. You can use these inert electrodes in a voltaic as well. So these are the big differences. Guarantee that you need to know these differences. You need to understand the big differences here between a voltaic thermo favored cell 
and an electrolytic cell, which is thermo unfavored. For these next few slides, I don't actually hold you accountable for this, but I kind of just want to make you aware of this, and we're not even going to go too deep, but you would need to realize here that if water was actually present with an ionic compound in one of these electrolytic cells, you would actually have to compare the reduction potential of the cation to that of water, and the more positive of that comparison would be the one that actually happens, and then you would kind of need to do the same thing where you're comparing the oxidation potential of the anion to that of the potential for water, and the more positive is the one that actually happens. So this is a little bit more involved when water is involved, uh, and you actually have to do some comparisons here. But the good news is I'm not going to hold you accountable for this. I just wanted to make you aware of this so you can kind of ignore this slide in your study. Again, this is not something that I would focus on while you're studying. This is just showing you an example here where you have this taking place in water. So the first thing you would need to do is you would need to compare these reduction potentials of the cation in water and the more positive one is occurring. So in this case, the uh, nickel uh, reduction is more positive. So that's actually occurring here. But again, not holding you accountable for this. To keep going with this problem, you would also have to compare um, the anion to water and see which one would happen here. Uh, this is the oxidation, so they have to be flipped. Uh, the water was the more positive, so it would occur. Again, just this idea that you would compare these if you were actually uh, in water here, but again, you're not responsible for this. And then the last thing you would do is just add up your potentials, but again, it did require a little bit more work here because of being in water. You had to compare the two. Again, this is more or less just for your information. Don't worry about a particular example like this where you have to do this in water and compare the two. This brings us to electroplating here. This is when we use electrolysis to deposit a thin layer of one metal onto another metal. And this could be useful to improve the way it looks or prevent corrosion in some instances. So this is actually a very important process here. We're going to need to use an electrical current to make this electroplating happen. But essentially, you might have heard of some, you know, spoons or some silverware here being electroplated. Basically, you could use uh, a battery here, okay? You could actually use an electric current to cause the silver to plate on to the spoon or on the silverware itself. You're actually using electrolysis to make this happen. You might have heard about them doing this with certain car parts. They can kind of, um, you know, improve the way they look or to prevent corrosion by using this electrolysis to kind of electroplate one metal onto another. And there's really three types of questions we could see about this for AP. First, we could be asked how many grams of a particular metal could be plated out. We could be asked how long it would take uh, to plate out a given mass. So they could be asking us about the time associated here, or they could actually ask us to calculate the average current. Right? So there's three main questions you could see here, and you have to know how to, about, how to go about uh, doing each of these. But the good news is you're basically just doing um, some conversions here, basically using some dimensional analysis, as you'll see. Here's just an example of using electrolysis to do some electroplating. We were actually using uh, copper here, and we're going to do some copper plating. Essentially, the copper ions, all right, uh, are going to go and be plated here. So the copper will actually be plated onto the silver. So we're going to deposit a thin layer here of our copper on the silver itself. But notice we need to use some type of external source of energy here. We are not generating electric current. This is a thermo unfavored. So we're using some type of electricity to make this happen. But this is an example of electroplating where we're plating one metal onto another using that electric current. An important equation that we need here for these problems is this one here, I equals Q divided by T, all right? You might not explicitly use this equation uh, to solve the problem. You might use this idea in a problem kind of in your uh, dimensional analysis here. Obviously, if you wanted to find the current, Okay, if you're asked in a problem to find the current, right, 
This is going to be in amps, all right? If you wanted to find amps, you would need to get the charge, and then you would need to get the time, and then divide the two. That's how you would find uh, the amps here. Uh, but you need to realize here that essentially how we use this a lot as well is understanding that one amp is equal to one coulomb per second, all right? You can see here by the units, your charge would be in coulombs, your time would be in seconds. So a big use of this equation is when we're doing our uh, conversion here and doing our dimensional analysis, we need to know that one amp is the same thing as a coulomb per second. If they give you amps in the problem, you know that that's the same thing as the number of coulombs per second, and that'll help with your conversion here. Uh, don't forget that we know that there's 96,485 coulombs for every mole. That's Faraday's constant. So you have to use these ideas and uh, the problems here, and I think you'll see just by doing the problems, they will make a lot more sense. But definitely understand this idea that an amp is the same thing as a coulomb per second. I said there are three uh, main versions of these problems. Let's just say you wanted to find the number of grams plated out. I'll kind of explain it to you here in words, but realize the examples are going to be really where it's at so you can see what's actually taking place. Basically, you're going to have to use kind of some stoic dimensional analysis conversion here um, to get time to seconds. So essentially, you need to get your time to seconds that they'll give you. And then we'll use the current that they give us, which is the same thing as coulombs per second if they give it to us in amps, which will get us the charge. Then we can use uh, the one mole for every 96,485 coulombs here. That's essentially our Faraday's constant to get to the amount of electrons involved. And then we can use our half reaction here to figure out the number of moles of the electrons that are involved here. Um, and you'll see what that looks like. And then we just convert moles to grams. Obviously, if we wanted to find out the time, we would just reverse these steps. And if we wanted to find out uh, the amps here, we would need to get the charge and the time and divide the two because an amp is the same thing as a coulomb per second or our charge per time. I think just seeing the examples is going to make a little bit more sense so we can uh, jump right into those. The first example here says, how many minutes must a current of five amps be applied to a solution of Ag plus to produce uh, 10.5 grams of silver metal? So we are looking for uh, the time here, essentially, okay? So they gave us the amps, and they gave us the grams of silver. If you're given a problem like this, and you uh, are given amps, remember, amps is the same thing as coulombs per second. Essentially, it's like a conversion here. So I'm going to use that in my problem along the way. I'm going to need to start with the gram amount. So I have... 10.5 grams here of the silver metal, okay? Well, I know that the moles of electrons are going to be important here. So if I can get rid of grams, which we know there's 107.87 grams of silver for every one mole of silver. That's right from your periodic table. So your grams will cancel. Now you'll be in moles of silver. Again, we said we need to get to moles of electrons here. We know the moles of electrons are going to be involved. Well, I know for every one mole of silver, there's a certain number of electrons that are involved here. Well, if you look at the half reaction, you can see there's only one electron involved. So there's one mole of E minus for every one mole of silver. So essentially, we took the grams, got to moles, and then we used the half reaction to see how many moles of electrons are involved here. Sometimes they don't give you the half reaction. Sometimes they might give you like uh, the formula here and you have to kind of figure out the charge of the ion you're using and you have to know how many electrons are involved. So be careful with that. Pay attention to the charge of the um, metal that you're looking at here. So now the moles of silver cancel. I'm in moles of electrons. Well, do I know anything involving moles of electrons? Well, yes. We know Faraday's constant. We know 9, 6, 485 coulombs for every one mole of electrons. So our electrons cancel, and now I'm in my charge. I'm in coulombs here. I got to get to time. And this is where your amps will come in. We know that 5 amps is the same thing as 5 
coulombs per second. According to my problem here, I need coulombs to be on the bottom to cancel. So that means I have 5.00 coulombs for every second. So you can see how I used my amps here to convert from charge to time unit. So the coulombs cancel, and now I'm in seconds. But the question says, how many minutes? So you just need to keep going here. All right. I know there's 60 seconds for every one minute. Your seconds cancel, and now you are in minutes. When you plug and chug and sig fig, it comes out to be 31.3 minutes here. All right. So you can see how if you're given a version like this, where you're given the gram amount and you're given the amps, use the amps along the way. But you got to get used to, you know, taking your grams, getting them to moles, using the moles of electrons here. You have to pay attention to the actual moles of electrons that are involved based on the charge. Then you use your Faraday's constant to get to the charge. Use your amps to get to time and then just convert to the units you want. That's all you're really doing in these electroplating problems is just watching your unit and converting to the unit that you want. Next example here says how much calcium will be produced in an electrolytic cell of molten calcium chloride if a current of 0.452 amps is passed through a cell for 1.5 hours. So in this example, we're given the time and the amps, and we want to find the amount, okay? But it's the same idea. You're given amps along with, you know, the time here. Use amps because that's the same thing as coulombs per second along the way here as part of your conversion. So you're going to start with the 1.5 hours, okay? So I know that if I'm starting here with hours, all right, I know that amps the same thing as coulombs per second. That's going to allow me to switch from time to charge. So if the amps are coulomb per second, I need to get my time to seconds here. So I know that there's going to be 60 minutes for every one hour. Hours will cancel. Then I know that there's going to be 60 seconds for every one minute. My minutes cancel. Now I'm in seconds. Now that I'm in seconds, I can use my amps here. I know I'm going to have to use my amps, so if amps are coulombs per second, I got to get to seconds. So according to this now, seconds obviously go on the bottom. So in this case, the 0 0.452 coulombs goes on the top. All right, 0 0.452 coulombs per second is the same thing as saying 0 0.452 amps. Seconds cancel. Now I'm in charge unit. Now I'm in coulombs. Once you get to coulombs, you know you're going to need to use Faraday's constant. So coulombs are going to need to be on the bottom. We have 96485 coulombs for every one mole of E minus here. Coulombs cancel. Now I'm in a moles of electrons. I know I can use that to eventually get to the amount here. All right. According to uh, the substance I'm using, according to the half reaction, moles of electrons obviously have to go on the bottom here. How many do you need? Well, if you look, the half reaction is given. It tells you you need two moles of electrons. If that wasn't given, okay, just keep in mind, that wasn't given, you'd have to look at the Ca2 plus here and realize that the charge of Ca is two plus and you would need two E minus to kind of balance that out. So just be careful. You're not always given the half reaction here. You have to kind of maybe find the charge and realize the number of electrons from the compound in the prop. So I know there's going to be two moles of electrons here for every one mole of the calcium. So my moles of electrons cancel. Now I'm in moles of calcium. Well, I can get that to grams. I know that for every one mole here of the calcium, when I look up the grams, there's going to be 40.08 grams. My moles cancel. Now I'm in grams, the amount of calcium here. When I plug, chug, and sig fig, hopefully you get 0 0.51 grams here. So this is the amount of uh, calcium here that will be produced under these conditions. But again, you had a number with the amps. We used the amps along the way in our problem. But you can see pretty much we had to get the time units to seconds. So we could use the amps being equal to coulombs per second to get the charge. And then use the uh, charge, get the moles of electrons, which allowed us to get to the grams. It's just doing conversions here, watching your units along the way, and of course, paying attention to sig figs. One more final example here that I want you to try on your own. 
So you can see here, we want to see how many seconds would be required to produce 50 grams of magnesium from magnesium chloride if the current is 100 amps. So I would say pause the video right now, try this. When you rejoin, I'll have it solved for you and we'll see how you did. So pause the video and try this right now. Hopefully this is the answer you got. You had to take your grams, get to moles, and then once you were in moles, you could see the number of moles of electrons we needed. We need two moles of electrons here uh, to balance this from our half reaction, Mg2 plus essentially. Uh, once you're in moles of electrons, you use your Faraday's constant. And then once you're in the charge, the coulombs, we know that amps is the same thing as coulombs per second. So the coulombs need to go on the bottom. There's 100 coulombs for every second here based on the amps. But then we're in seconds, which is what the unit we wanted. So you just plug, chug, watch your sig figs here. You do need that decimal place at the end. But there's 3,970 uh, decimal place seconds here uh, that would be required. So you need to be able to do all the versions of these electroplating problems. But you can see you're pretty much just doing conversions here. And make sure you understand that idea that um, a, an amp is the same thing as a coulomb per second.